thank you very much everybody for coming um you i think you all know me susan newman i'm the head of economics here at the ou and i'm very welcome uh, pleased to welcome you all to this economics seminar um so and i'll be chairing today as well and i also before we begin i want to say thanks very much to christina lascaridis who's done almost all of the legwork in uh, organising this seminar, not only this one, but also the whole series. Um, so yes, as I said, I'll be chairing today's event on barriers and boosters for the landowners who adopt agroforestry. And we are delighted to be uh, to host uh, two distinguished speakers on the topic. Ayora Zabala, who's a very new lecturer in, the economic, in, in economics at the OU, who joined us just at the beginning of this year. And we're also joined with Anique Hillbrand, who's program manager at Oro Verde, Tropical Forest Foundation, and they'll be presenting on barriers and boosters for landowners to adopt agroforestry practices, drawing from their extensive research and hands-on experience in Mexico and Guatemala. But before I start, I'm just going to go through a bit of housekeeping and, and share our future events and seminar series as well. So you'll see that this meeting is being recorded and the recording of this event will be uploaded in due course on the website. Um, and after the speakers have spoken, we'll have a Q&A. So please use the chat function or raise your hand and we can bring you in as well. Um, just a few words about the format also of today's session. Each of our speakers, Anik and uh, Iora, will initially introduce uh, their presentations for five minutes before coming back to substantiate them further. That's hopefully to promote a bit more dialogue between the two speakers as well. So let me tell you a few words about the seminar series. Um, we've been running these since the end of the last academic year. And the real aim of it is to bring together academics uh, to exchange, share and engage in dialogue with policymakers, practitioners, activists, industry representatives and members of the public. So what I've called economists in the wild outside of our, uh, our ivory towers. Um, and we started this series to bring together diverse realms of expertise, um, all working on current challenges across a broad range of topic. So just to let you know, coming up next in the series, um, and uh, we've got a couple of events coming up for the rest of the year. So we have two more events. Um, the first one on May the 25th is with our staff tutor, Dr. Ayobami Ilori, who will be speaking on fiscal policy in the post financial crisis era. And he'll be joined by Mustafa Chadzuz, who's head of data science and fiscal policy at the, uh, Her Majesty's Treasury. And then on uh, Wednesday, June the 8th, we'll have a seminar entitled Essential for What? where we'll explore research on the concept and practice of essential work as part of social reproduction. And that will be, uh, we'll be inviting uh, Sarah Stevano from SOAS. And we'll also be joined um, by some artists who have been involved in an artist activist um, exhibition on the question of essential work. So that's coming up. Um, but but uh, uh, let me now take the chance to um, introduce our speakers for today before uh, I let them take the floor. So as I mentioned, Aya Zabala is a lecturer in economics here at the OU and she joined in January uh, 2022. Prior to that, she was senior editor at the journal Nature Sustainability and an affiliated lecturer um, in environment policy and environment, uh, sorry, in environmental policy and economics at the University of Cambridge. Her research focuses on the implementation of environmental sustainability policies, including the integration of pluralist views around the challenges and controversies. As she has conducted and published research on a range of sustainability policies over the last 15 years, and she uses a range of methods and tools, including our statistical language, Q methodology, econometrics, multi-criteria decision methods, and geographic information systems. So a wide range of approaches to tackle an enormous uh, and uh, diverse issue. Our second speaker is Anique Hillbrand, who's Programme Manager at Oro Verde, Tropical Forest Foundation, um, and uh, which, which works in forest and landscape restoration. Previously, she worked for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, where she coordinated projects in Latin America on enhancing and enabling environment, uh, environment at the na national level for forest agriculture restoration and on implementation of agroforestry and forest conservation me me measures. So uh, Anique is the author of various studies on agroforestry and on forest and landscape restoration 
and has recently published a study on financing biodiversity and restoration, which highlights key lessons learned from pioneer projects around the world. Uh, she's received her postgraduate degree in rural development from the Humboldt University in Berlin and has a master's in agroforestry from the, from the Bangor University in Wales. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the first speaker, uh, I believe that'll be Iora, to speak for five minutes before and introduce her talk before he'll, uh, before Anik. Um, hello, thank you very much, uh, Susan, for the kind introduction, and also Christina for the invitation and for organizing, and as well as Anik oh, for uh, joining us today. Um, so. I've always been intrigued by why and how people behave in an environmentally friendly way. I do it myself, but quite often I don't even know why I do it. Uh, it might be because of um, it's the right thing to do, but also because it's easy, it's playful, whatever. Um, so, but I, I, that's why I'm interested in understanding the reasons and also how this can be supported. So. Before I continue, I would like you to think about one such behavior. So think about any individual behavior that is decidable from an environmental sustainability point of view, and that would be great to promote. It could be something easy, it could be something difficult, it doesn't matter. Just think about actions that are good for the planet, in your view, um, and then why you would do that. Why would you recycle? Why would you uh, reduce meat intake or take the bike instead of the car? Um, in thinking about these reasons um, helps us to think about what are the barriers for this behavior, meaning what are the barriers for, for a widespread adoption of these uh, more sustainable practices. So th take one of the head behaviors that you could think about before. It could be uh, water, it could be recycling, it could be switching to renewable energies, um, reducing the thermostat. I'm, I'm here looking at the icons or taking the bike. Um, and the reasons to do any of these could be economic, a matter of cost and benefits, but it could be also ideological, also because it's the easiest thing to do, or because it makes one feel good, like a warm glow. Um, and in what I'm going to talk about now, I'm focusing on the individual behavior. So uh, at this stage, I exclude the behavior of private firms, large groups, organizations, governments, and so on. I'm thinking about yourselves and, and individual people. So that's the, the initial statement. And over to you, Anik. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you for, very much for the invitation, Professor Newman, and thank you, Ayora and Christina, for the organization. I'm very proud to be part of this very innovative uh, webinar series. And um, today I'm going to share with you experience on forest and landscape restoration, uh, specifically on um, on a large scale project in Guatemala. But before taking you to this um, to this project, actually, I'm I wanted to show you a bit the broader picture of why does it make sense uh, to plant trees? Is it only about planting trees, but maybe also about restoring uh, at a larger scale, at a landscape scale? Who are the actors, and maybe also what are the main um, international convention and um, initiatives that are promoting this movement. So from here, I would like to um, tell you that like around three billion people in our on our planet are suffering from land degradation, and that's also at the same time quite a big of uh, opportunity. Actually, if we bring back and restore land uh, to make it. Um, to make the soil better, the nutrition of the people, but also to improve the um, the income of local communities, and then it will lead to um, reaching our sustainable development goals and to adapt to climate change and uh, climate mitigation. But actually, where did it start? So I choose two very famous um, research for you, and we start at the left. Uh, one is from 2011. This is like 10 years ago. It's from Minamaya et al. And he was with his research team one of the first one that made a bit popular um, the world. He called it the world of opportunity where on our planet we can actually integrate trees and restore degraded woodland. It doesn't need always to be a forest. It could also be other land use systems like agroforestry or integrating trees into 
um, um, civil pastoral systems and so on. But actually in 2011, not a lot of people were talking about planting trees and just recently with climate change, it's got much more attention at political level, but then also for private sector, we talk a lot about mitigation and so on. And then there was this study um, just like around one and a half years ago from ETH Zurich University from the Grother Lab. It's a group around uh, Bastien um, that they were um, actually pledging or showing by um, the current forest cover on our planet. They started to um, establish kind of a model where they could see um, how, how big is the overall potential to plant trees. And then they would come up with this assumption that um, planting trees is the most effective um, climate change solution to date that we have. That's according to them what they said uh, one and a half years ago. And that um, that we, by planting trees, can actually make a big change and withdraw more than 25% of all the atmospheric carbon we are having at the moment on the ground within this uh, trees. So that's quite a big statement. And then it got a lot criticized in the media because it was a bit also interpreted in the wrong way, but actually um, we have to see that obviously planting trees is not the solution for everything, uh, not the solution for our climate change. Uh, we have to change our economies and how we work and how we produce uh, and transform this, but then also obviously by um, restoring and um, planting trees, we can adapt to climate change, we can get more resilient in our communities, and so it can be a solution. So before handing over, I just wanted to show you this broader picture, because actually in recent years there came up a lot of different, several international initiatives that have been launched. Some of them may be uh, familiar to you. You know that there are the Sustainable Development Goals. There want, there's one, uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 15, which is on uh, related to um, um, land and uh, how you manage it. And there is a target 15.3 that strives to uh, achieve a land degradation neutral world so that uh, we don't degrade any more our land, for instance, but then there are also other um, initiatives such as the bond challenge. It's a non-binding commitment, um, voluntary by many countries of the world, that they want to restore around 350 million hectares of land until 2030. Then there are other um, other international movements um, and there is a, now the UN decade on ecosystem restoration which also brings kind of uh, the importance to the high political momentum but also to, to reach these goals we need the effort in the countries so of course if we then go to the country level we need governments we need the private sector civil society and science so actually um, Ayora's and my presentation will match very well because then Ayora will focus more on how to, um, what is the decision making at local level from the perspective of a person or of a farmer. And I will um, give you some more insight on how we do this actually at a country level and at a regional level involving local communities and NGOs and private sector to this movement. Great, thank you, Anik. Um, sharing again the slide I left and as you can see both introductions were quite different but they all converged together to the same point actually. Um, so um, when studying the barriers and, and drivers of uh, pro-environmental behavior um, here we a lot of disciplines or fields within economics are focused on this so so here we merge knowledge from environmental economics ecological resource economics and other smaller ones which are gaining a name uh, with a race of environmental concerns such as uh, energy economics or climate change economics uh, this is just to give you the picture the pluralistic picture of where all this situates um, so here we focus on planting trees in productive farming systems. These are all under the umbrella of agroforestry practices and that's where I'm focusing on because it's one, um, a major tool for land restoration. 
um, which also combines um, benefits for, for the individual, so it contributes to development. Um, in this case, agroforestry practices are those where farmers combine crops or pasture with trees um, that have been that have also purposes for their business. Um, in the image, you see a plot of land that is used to grow corn in Mexico, which is left bare after harvest. Here, farmers uh, let the cows come and browse the remaining straw. And soon after this image was taken, the rain season would come and it, was, it would wash a lot of the soil into the streams. In a few decades, lands like this could reach the bedrock underneath, meaning you cannot grow anything there. Um, and the empirical uh, project I will talk about later aimed to encourage farmers in this area to plant some trees here that also provide fodder for cattle. Um, and this is a type of agroforestry which is called silvopasture. Um, this has us, well, um, this has us already been introduced a little bit by Anik. Um, you know, planting trees has become very relevant in the UK as well, especially after the Conference of the Parties for Climate Change last year in Glasgow, after which the UK government launched very ambitious programs to help plant trees across the country. Um, as you might know, the net zero carbon pledges have multiplied globally, among countries, companies. So that means that a lot of agents are compromising to emit zero carbon and, and greenhouse gas uh, emissions to the atmosphere by a given date, for example, 2050. There are two main ways to achieve these pledges. One is decarbonizing, meaning reducing emissions of green, greenhouse gases. And that involves reducing the use of fossil fuels, increasing insulation, efficiency, and so on. So reducing the amount that is emitted. Um, the other way is through offsettings or compensations. This means that, for example, a company continues to emit the same amount of greenhouse gases, but they also pay for another agent or institution to capture these emissions, uh, for example, by conserving peatland or habitats or through more technological means. So to achieve uh, zero carbon, the UK is also relying importantly on capturing carbon through nature-based solutions, which you might have heard about. And in simple words, these nature-based solutions, one uh, approach to do that means, for example, planting the right tree in the right place. What do we mean when talking about planting trees in productive systems? So to put in context what comes next, these images illustrate the very first decision that has to be made when planting such trees. And this is the sort of tree cover um, that you want to achieve, whether it's a woodland or uh, uh, trees in low density and so on. And what are the species that you want to plant? One can have hedgerows, which are very popular in the UK. You don't see them so often in other European countries. You can have trees in low density. You can also have trees in urban parks. Uh, those count also towards uh, capturing emissions. Um, but each of these types of tree covers have quite different opportunity costs. So agroforests, in this case, they can be a climate positive practice because, well, they have several environmental benefits. So in addition to capture carbon, they can also enhance the soil properties, they can provide habitat for biodiversity. Um, and thinking of the picture I showed you earlier from Mexico, they can bring benefits to farmers, such as uh, additional products like feed for cattle and uh, the need for less chemical inputs for farming uh, uh, maize. Um, they can also help soil erosion management, and that's a huge uh, issue in many places, especially mountainous areas. Um, and when talking about agroforestry systems, a lot of research is focused on the global south, and therefore is framed as a conservation and development strategy. But is the, the lessons that we learn, I believe, um, are also equally useful in farming system, systems in higher income countries. Because at the end of the day, a landowner or farmer who is managing the land is facing, um, in a way, similar decision making processes as whether it's in the UK, whether it's in Mexico or in Guatemala. Um, so, um, 
Changing land use practices is important to fulfill these climate pledges, but also for many other environmental goals. Um, so now, having identified a solution, which is this type of treescape, agroforestry, let's say it could be other solutions, but we are focusing on this uh, in this talk. Um, the question I want to focus on is on how to incentivize the adoption of this solution, um, which is what I highlight here in, in, in orange. This starts by understanding what might be the motivations and the barriers for individuals to decide why they want to plant trees in their plots. So, um, an almost classical intervention, because it's been implemented and popularized in, the la in the several decades already, are um, payments for ecosystem services of which carbon payments are a subset and are going to become a major source of funding for this sort of restoration uh, programs for the carbon capture service. But of course, these, these um, ecosystems, they can provide other services. Um, so I wanted to show a slide about payments for ecosystem services because this is a very popular um, um, instrument and this is um, what many would say is the, the is, well is the market-based approach, a very straightforward uh, way of thinking for for economists. And the idea of PES is that they ensure that the the economic benefits for private providers outweigh the costs through this uh, payment, and therefore that internalizes the ex the positive externality of having these trees, which have a cost, a private cost, but a benefit for for society and the environment. Um, this diagram shows three scenarios um, that help us understand what the payment amount should be. So how much should we pay? The other question, the other big question is who should pay for that? Um, so if pasture is the most profitable use, then the payment should be at least the opportunity cost of transforming this pasture into forest. Um, but this is a range, so the maximum payments, and for many this is a source of confusion in interpreting what a payment, a payment for a customer should be, the maximum payment should be the total economic value of that forest, uh, which should involves valuing all the ecosystem services it provides, not just uh, carbon capture, but uh, soil erosion uh, benefits, biodiversity habitat, plenty of services. Um, which are very difficult to estimate comprehensively um, because the natural science is just not there. there is, uh, it's difficult to uh, understand all the ecological um, dynamics that are behind such services. So when talking about payments, we should focus on this minimum one, which is how much do you need to change the, the person's behavior. Um, this instrument, as any other, has several theoretical assumptions or conditions, including rationality. But we know that behavioral economists and also psychologists, they would tell us that the costs and benefits are not the only consideration we have when changing our behavior. Um, to think about drivers and challenges of, of planting the trees, I want to emphasize that this is a rather complex and lengthy pro uh, process. In the picture, you can see um, the images of seedlings of one of these trees that um, um, we uh, try to encourage farmers in Mexico to plant. Uh, this is a species of trees which provides um, food for cattle. Once it grows, obviously, it becomes a very beautiful big tree. Um, but in that process, so in this growth process, planting and growing the trees involves a sequence of actions over time, and the combination uh, of uh, up and, and and the combination of many actions. Right. So you need to choose the appropriate species, uh, which ideally should be native, so that you don't need to care so much about them because um, they will thrive in the ecosystem. Uh, the trees, the seeds need to be planted. Uh, possibly in a tree nursery for some months. Then in the meantime, somebody needs to choose a land that is suitable um, ecologically, but also a land that they are happy that it will be dedicated to um, that woodland for a very long time. And that's one of the main challenges when planting trees, um, that farmers, both 
in Mexico and also from conversations I've had in, in the UK as well, uh, farmers um, doubt very much whether they want to plant trees because it's a very long term compromise. They don't know what's going to happen in 10 years time, so they don't want to, to log that land with that. That's a big, big issue in this case. So most policy headlines talk about planting trees and here I want you to be critical um, because it's not just about planting them, but also about growing them. Because once planted, somebody needs to visit the plot every now and then, take care of the plants while they grow for one, two years in the tropics, but 10 years or more, depending on the species and the location. Um, they need to care for pests, water, animals browsing. This requires labor and possibly other resources as well. So a farmer might consider all this when deciding whether to plant a tree. And then once they are on it, on like on the compromise of planting it, they need to make consecutive decisions like almost every year or every time they go to, to visit the plot where they have planted. Um, and this is a period in which the farmer needs to um, take care of it, but there might be many other things in, on their plate. Um, so because of this implementation or adoption in stages, um, this type of a pro environmental behavior is quite particular. It's not just um, recycling or saving water that you do very easily. Uh, you make the decision, you do it. Where, but in this case, there is a long period before the whole action is completed, which is the timing with the tree is there. Um, so, given what this takes, it's important to understand that this decision is taken in a broader context of livelihood decisions about whether to do farming activities or off-farm activities and also other sources of income that might influence um, how farmers are dedicate, how farmers uh, allocate their labor, uh, time and, and the investment they have available. So in this context, taking care of the trees could be a matter of changing habits, um, it could be a matter of changing the setup so that it's easier for them to do it. They could get better infrastructure, um, but sometimes it could also be that they do it because their neighbors do it. So a person follows social influence or social pressure, or it could be simply a matter of having the right information. So having good extension services that uh, and trusted extension services that inform about what are the species, how to do it and so on. So these are all considerations that are hard to put in into the cost benefit analysis framework that um, you would um, apply when thinking about payments for ecosystem services. Uh, but all these considerations affect very importantly whether individuals adopt the behavior. So to capture these considerations in a structured way, here I'm presenting uh, the synthesis of a review of 70 studies of adoption of sustainable agricultural practices. And this figure, um, this is a part of the figure, I'll show the rest in a few in the next slides. This shows groups of categories of predictors uh, in the literature on adoption of sustainable practices. Um, well, predictors and also generally independent variables that researchers introduce in regression models of adoption of sustainable agricultural practices. There are many of such variables. Uh, typically, you would always include in such regressions uh, the age, gender and so on, because people think that maybe if you're older, you might have more experience, you're more likely to adopt. There are many, many hypotheses. There is not much consensus. Um, and that's why I thought it would be a better idea to just capture all these categories and use this as a sort of inventory of uh, factors that you should consider when implementing such a policy. So check whether um, the conditions or the factors that you have in this kind of theoretical inventory are um, uh, applicable on the ground or they are missing and so on. And for example, one um, that you can see here is, well, this is the group of the characteristics of the farm and the household, which are essential. Well, the basic one is, is land and a big issue when planting trees is having um, uh, owning land or having access to, to manage it, but also having it secured. Uh, so having secured land tenure. tenure. 
that's one factor, but here you could include all of the factors, whether there is enough labor in the household, in the household. Um, and then issues about pathways. So here there is one that I want to highlight, which is the successor factor. Sometimes when you have a farm that has gone from a generation to generation, um, farmers care about the future of their children and therefore they, they think about a long-term investment and therefore they might plant the trees. So that, that's a factor uh, sometimes. So um, turning these factors around, we can find the reasons for individuals to make an effort to plant the trees. Um, as I said, having a, a, an appropriate and safely tenure plot of land. Um, and then we could identify in a specific case whether that factor is missing. And if it's missing, then the intervention on the external policy could try to um, do something to uh, address that issue. Um, and here I'm going to go a bit quickly around the rest of the factors. I don't want to focus too much on this. Uh, you, can, you can have this on the slides, but all the factors are uh, social, the social environment, whether you follow what your neighbors are doing uh, and so on, uh, the institutions you have. And here I'm excluding the political and the macro co context, which Anik will talk more about. Uh, then you have factors related to the practice itself, whether farmers do have information about it, they, whether they, they know how to do it, uh, whether they trust the sources of the information. Sometimes you have an extension uh, person coming in and, and they don't quite trust what they're saying. Um, and then whether the practice, the new practice is feasible for them um, in terms of whether they, they are capable, they are able or they or it aligns as well with what they are doing. Um, if they have been doing, if they've been uh, doing other sorts of uh, uh, plants growing activities, it might be easier to, 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 do, to grow something new, right? Obviously, economical and rational motives. But then there are a whole sort of, of um, factors that I call intrinsic to the individual, which could be objective, age, gender, health status, uh, level of education and so on, but also subjective, which consists of um, things like attitudes, perceptions, um, whether they are aware of, em of environmental degradation and therefore that motivates them to, 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 to do this uh, behavior and so on. So this is a whole range of um, factors that could also affect. So, um, after having this very broad overview of what could affect, what are the possible things that can be like leverage points uh, for people to, to, to switch to conducting a pro-environmental activity, I want to focus on, on just a few of them through an empirical case study um, that takes us to Mexico. Uh, in this map, you can see this is um, a map of the south of Mexico. In the very south, the state of Chiapas, there is a beautiful uh, mountain range, uh, tropical forest, well conserved. Um, and there are lots of little communities in the buffer area of that protected uh, forest. Um, in, it is in this community where I took this photo that I show at the beginning of, of all the uh, maize plot with the straw. And it is here where a local research center uh, started a project to encourage people to plant trees uh, that would give for their, uh, for their like feed for, for cattle um, to, to, to the cows they were also raising. Um, this is a picture of that area. So you can see on the lower lands of the mountains, there is a lot of degradation. There are no trees. Um, and in the picture, maybe it's not very clear, but cows are left roam in the forest and they step on the soil, meaning that they make little pathways, but slowly, slowly the soil comes down to the bottom of the valley, which uh, could end up in, in severe degradation. So here we are in this project where they, they provided material, the local research group, they provided material and training and they organized several uh, uh, training sessions for farmers to um, plant trees in their in their plots in this small community and what they did is uh, after the the farmers planted uh, the plant uh, the trees in their plots and then after one year they um, the researchers measured how many trees were still alive and what was the the, the sort of the, the the height or the biomass that was there right 
Um, and this is where our, my work came in, which, is, which was to understand why some farmers had had more success um, than others. So here um, I and with, with a, very, a great team, we collected socioeconomic data uh, for several independent variables that we wanted to focus on. I wanted to focus on, on the livelihoods um, of people. Um, so the focus was on livelihood. So the, 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 the hypothesis was that um, people who were, have more diverse livelihoods, meaning that they do lots of activities. So you can have people who only grow maize and beans, but you can also have people who grow uh, maize, beans, they have cattle, they have poultry, they have lots of things, right? Um, and you can think about that in, in your own terms as well. Some of us do lots of things. Some of us do focus on, on single ones. So in this study, we focus on the livelihood diversity of people and how that affected uh, their participation in the program. Now, I've mentioned that um, adoption of uh, these agroforestry systems or, or growing trees is a sequential uh, process where you, in this case, in this project, uh, there is a first decision to participate in the project. There were um, other subsequent decisions, another stage in which people decide whether to allocate the, the sufficient labor to that. And so we decided to model that um, decision of ado that adoption in two stages. So uh, in order to understand whether and how different predictors would affect um, both participation and the level of adoption afterwards. So that's the, that's the gist of the study. Um, essentially, the regression model is quite a classical agricultural adoption model, uh, like conceptually. Um, but then we model this into stages using a regression model that allows us to separate these two stages. And we, we, we could see that uh, some variables affected differently at each stage. Um, not just the magnitude, obviously, because that could change very easily, but also the direction. And what we saw, the, 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 the main lesson from this, is that um, diversity is the variable that we were mostly interested in. Um, so people who were more diverse in their livelihoods, they were more likely to say yes to participating in the pro in the project, which uh, we argue that it's maybe because there, there are many possible explanations, but it could be because they like trying new things. So if they see the opportunity, OK, I'm going to see what happens. I will try. What happened is that once they were in the program, they were less likely to succeed, um, meaning that they, they, they had less trees. Uh, after after the year, uh, what we the, our interpretation um, was that these people, yes, they they like trying new things, but once they are in the program, they might not have so much time because uh, they have so many things on on their plate, so they don't really um, work with the dedication that trees need. So that was the lesson of this paper, which. Um, you can see in very small letter was accepted. It was accepted yesterday, very coincidentally. Uh, but now I want to finish the presentation with another study, which is a method that is not very commonly seen in economics, and maybe you are interested in this, um, which is we wanted to understand more, um, not just quantitatively livelihoods and so on, but also we wanted to understand more in depth what was the perspective of these people regarding planting trees. What were the attitudes, these subjective aspects that I mentioned in, in the framework initially? Um, for that, we conducted this um, Q study, which is a semi-quantitative method that allows us to kind of label people according to their views. And you could see, for example, a typical application would be to label ideologies. No? You could label people into in the spectrum from right wing to left wing um, and then understand very much in depth, what really shapes that ideology or that, typo that typology of views. Um, the results of this study, semi-qualitative, um, which is, consists on giving people some statements and asking them to rank them according to their own opinion. Um, then you analyze this data, you reduce using multivariable reduction techniques. Um, and we found three main typologies of farmers among those who were in the program. 
some of them were like what we call the pioneers, who were um, the ones who were more likely to try, the, 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 the ones with a broader livelihood and so on, the ones who, who are the pioneers in any diffusion process. Um, and they would try, we, we interpreted, they would try the practice not because they uh, are environmentally aware, but just because they want to see what they can gain from that practice. Um, so engaging these guys was relatively easy. Then you had other people who we call the laggards. These were people who would not adopt the practice unless they really see everyone else doing it and, and having benefits. And then you had another smaller group who had a more environmentally tuned attitude, but they were not necessarily the ones more um, likely to innovate. Um, so this is for um, my presentation, the results of this, of this study. Um, here I capture a few policy implications of the study. Essentially, um, the importance of accounting for heterogeneity in people's attitudes and, and people's livelihoods and people's decision making. So some people might are different. So the policy instrument that might be more um, aligned with their motivations might be different. Um, so it's important to integrate these policy instruments and also having seen that planting trees is a process in sequences, it's important as well to introduce different instruments at each stage. So for example, an instrument at the beginning to encourage those who are less likely to participate, to encourage them to take part. And then once um, they start participating, another instrument to encourage those who have not much time because they have very diverse livelihoods, uh, to encourage these to, 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 to help them with the barriers they, they encounter. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. And um, I hope you found some interesting food for thought and I will pass um, the round to Anik. Yeah, that was very uh, inspiring. And uh, let's see what we can get from your findings from the two studies, uh, which we are like implementing already in Guatemala in a project or what is uh, still missing there. Um, just before uh, entering uh, the topic of the project, I just wanted to explain you the concept of forest landscape restoration, which is an ongoing process on restoring the ecological function. Um, of an area. I, I, actually, it's not just tree planting or um, working at a specific site, but it would, uh, in the best way, um, include all actors in a landscape or a region, involve stakeholders uh, as, like, for instance, also vulnerable people or indigenous people, private sector, and also kind of develop a governance mechanism and how on decide how to use which area and which part of the land in the landscape. So maybe you have agriculture, you have um, protection area for wildlife reserves, you might have wetlands and so on. So all this would be seen in forest landscape restoration in the context um, as a approach that you could take to get a more resilient and uh, long-term development of an area. In the Forest Value Project, we work in Guatemala with two local um, NGOs. They are called Defensores de la Naturaleza and Haifa International um, for building innovative partnerships for forest uh, restoration. The project um, is already running for since six years. It will end in 2023 with a budget around 7 million euros financed by German um, Ministry and National Climate Change Initiative. And we are working in three areas in Guatemala, in um, La Candon National Park, Bocas de Polochic, and in Sierra de las Minas. Um, together with a team of around 40 people, I have uh, four colleagues here in Bonn located and the other colleagues uh, with working with the partner NGOs in Guatemala. Um, what is actually the issue that we are working on? First of all, there's a lot of degradation and deforestation in Guatemala. And, um, well, the, people would be suffering uh, a lot of malnutrition and um, poverty in the rural areas where we're working. Um, this is also connected to inner um, adequate capacities to market access. Um, it's usually uh, quite... Uh, 
rural area, there might be not the best infrastructure, so also the private sector um, would have a certain risk to invest uh, in value change or in the products that the smallholder farmer would offer. So um, this is kind of the, the context and then um, the, the project would work in different, let's say, outputs that we focus on. First of all, we would do different analysis in the regions depending on um, cultural factors and um, land productivity and landscape um, functionality, what would be the adequate uh, value change in products that farmers could produce in their agroforestry systems. But apart from agroforestry, we also have afforestation uh, and um, forest conservation um, in the project going on, as well as um, agriculture production um, activities and then we would support the farmers not only by getting the the new seeds for a new uh, product but you know building up the whole value change getting the adequate uh, capacities how to manage the product um, how to get the right uh, quality to sell it on the market and so on so within the project um, on the local level, we would also then scale up this pilot ideas to national level and would look um, into the policy framework where there are actually boundaries or difficulties or where there could be um, positive um, variables that we can change. Um, we had from um, IOTA that there are ecosystem payments in Guatemala, for instance, we have um, two kinds of those ones for planting trees, but uh, not all of them are di 